This is Prince Kaim Waset. He is one of my favorite ancient Egyptians. And he was the fourth son of the very powerful pharaoh Ramesses II, one of probably at least a hundred sons. And at one time in his life, Prince Kaim Waset was the crown prince. So he was stood to be the next in line to become pharaoh. Here he is. He was a high priest, a very powerful man. But in many ways, Egyptologists consider him to have been one of them. Because it's said that Prince Kaim Waset was never happier than when he was exploring the ancient tombs in Egypt and reading the ancient inscriptions. And we have preserved some of his jewellery. Look at this beautiful jewellery that belonged to him. And so after his death, legends began to circulate about Prince Kai Mwaset. And it was told that after a time of infertility, the prince and his wife, and her name is almost <coughs> completely unpronounceable, they had a magical child. And this magical boy, his name was Saul Cyrus. Notice the name of the god of the underworld. And even when he was a little boy, Saul Cyrus was seen to be very, very wise, very smart. And he had magical powers. That would have been fun. And one day, Sir Cyrus and his dad, the prince, were at home. And they could hear the wailing outside of a large funeral. And in Egyptian funerals, they really wailed big time. It sounded like this. Are you ready? That's what they do. At times of great sadness or at times of great joy. And even in the Egyptian church today, the Coptic church, they still do that when a baby's baptized. When the priest baptized the baby, they go, <laughs> to show how happy they are. So it's a sign of extreme emotion. And at a funeral, of course, you're very sad. But in Egypt, rich people paid people to do that for them at their funeral. So they looked out of the window, the prince and his son. And they could see the, all the gold and finery and funeral goods of this rich man being drawn along by a team of oxen in his golden mummy case, wearing a golden mask, with all sorts of fine furniture and precious items being buried with him. And at the same time, they could also see somebody, I guess, who worked for the city, you know, junior, junior, bottom end of the totem pole, dragging the dead body of a beggar on his mat to dump him in a hole in the desert because he had nobody to mourn for him or to bury him properly. And the father says to the boy, he says, I hope that when my time comes, I go out like the rich man. With lots of people to mourn me. I hope I share the rich man's fate. And the little boy turns to his dad. And says no. I hope dad. That you end up like this beggar. And the dad's hurt and offended. And says how can you say this? And he says. Well come with me to the tombs. And I will show you. So they go to the place where the tombs are. And the magical boy. And he said speaks a word of grim power and they find themselves in their spirits out of their bodies and they follow the souls of the rich man and of the poor man and they follow them into the underworld and to the judgment and the rich man the gods know has been very wicked very mean very cruel and he is punished in ways that are so horrible I can't even tell you about them. It's nasty. 
It's almost like he's fed to a monster. But the poor man, the gods find, has lived a good and virtuous life. And they see him. And the little boy says to his dad, Do you see that blessed spirit who is clothed in golden raiment, who wears the feathers of truth in his hair, and who stands close to the throne of Osiris? That spirit is the poor man who you saw carried to a beggar's grave with no one to mourn for him. Osiris himself ordered that the poor man should be given all the goods buried with the rich man and a place among the shining blessed spirits. And as they return home and back to their bodies, it is said that Prince Kai Mweset was afraid because he had seen what no living man had seen. And he knew that even the son of Pharaoh must fear the judgment of the next world. In the gospel today, we hear Jesus warning us of the same thing. He's warning us that if you are bad and wicked and mean, you might come to a sticky end in the next life. We see this rich man in the underworld talking to Abraham. And here are some pictures of this. Now this is from an ancient gospel book from about from the 10th century. You can see it is in three layers. And I will show you each layer a little bit closer up. There they are. And so at the top, we see the rich man dining on lots of food, wearing fine robes. And you can see the poor man, Lazarus, outside his door. He would have seen him every day when he went in and every day when he went out. And look at Lazarus. His body has sores on it. Even the dogs took care of him better than the rich man. Said that the dogs licked his sores to try and make him feel better. Because even dogs know that you take care of somebody who's sick. The rich man doesn't. And so we see what happens. In the next world, here we can see the poor man Lazarus in heaven with Abraham, the patriarch. And we can also see here, this is his soul being taken out of his body by the angels. And there he is in heaven with the angels. But underneath, we see the rich man who dies. And his soul is being taken away by these black devils here. And he's chained in the flames with the monster. You know, it says that the poor man went to the bosom of Abraham. And there's an ancient medieval poem that says that the rich man went to the bosom of a big snake forever and ever. That's not a nice place to be. And we see, if you were good, even if you're poor, if you were good in this life, God has many joys prepared for you which is so wonderful we can't even think about. But if you're a meanie, you better watch out. Because for meanies, here's a rich man in another icon. Look at him. He's like he's being fed to a monster. And you can see the same monster if you go out into the lobby of the church on the right hand side. You'll see the guardian angel saving us from the monster. There is, there he is. What else can we see here? We can see Lazarus lying outside the rich man's house. We can see the rich man wearing his fine clothes. Here he is. And the poor man outside. And they won't, he won't even give him the leftovers. He's such a meanie. Well, we see here what happens to meanies. So, of course, Jesus wants us to be good. Jesus wants us to be kind. 
But there's a little more to it than this. If you look at the name Lazarus, first of all, we see that the Hebrew is Eliezer. And we've Latinized it to be Lazarus. But the original name is Eliezer, and it means God is my help. And every Jewish person listening to Jesus telling this story would have remembered that Eliezer was also the name of Abraham's servant. Now, before Abraham changed his name to Abraham, he was Abram, Abram. And he complained to God, Lord, I have no sons and daughters. I have no children. I have nobody I have nobody to give an inheritance to. I will have no descendants. And God changed his name to Abraham and told him that he would have as many descendants as the stars of the sky. But when Abraham was complaining to God, he said, The only man who will have my inheritance is my servant, Eliezer of Damascus. It's there in Genesis 15. And every Jew listening to Jesus would have remembered this. That the name Eliezer was also the name of the poor man that Jesus was talking about. And it's like Jesus is saying, hey, sons of Abraham, remember that there's room in heaven for foreign servants. Eliezer came from Damascus in Syria. Jesus is saying that even poor foreign Syrian servants... And find a place in the kingdom of heaven. And as we look further into this parable. We see that the rich man is described as having five brothers. And apparently the fact that he wears purple robes and fine linen means he's almost certainly the high priest, Caiaphas. Because Caiaphas also, we learn from John's Gospel, had five brothers, who also, we find from history, later became high priests themselves. So maybe this story is a little, a lot more political than we realise. It's as if I were to tell you a story about a rich man A successful entrepreneur who made a lot of money in real estate and built towers and then became a ruler and then finally moved down by the ocean. You all know who I'm talking about. Now, Jesus, his audience would also have known exactly who Jesus was talking about. This man wearing purple and fine linen with five brothers. He was being political. And he says, they won't believe even if someone should rise from the dead. How ironic. Because as we well know, someone did rise from the dead. And did they believe? Not a bit of it. Even when another Lazarus, Lazarus of Bethany, rose from the dead. They didn't believe. The high priest and his family didn't believe. On the contrary, they made a plot to kill him. It's written there in the Gospels. They didn't believe at all. They wanted him dead. St. Augustine says this. Jesus kept quiet about the rich man's name and only mentioned the name of the poor man. The rich man's name might have been thrown around in this world, but God kept quiet about it. It's like God wasn't interested. doesn't matter. The other man's name was lost in silence, but God spoke it. Please do not be surprised, says St. Augustine. God only read out what was written in his book. You see, God who lives in heaven kept quiet about the rich man's name because he did not find it written in heaven. And he spoke the poor man's name because he found it written there. Indeed, he gave instructions For it to be written there. May God write all of our names in his book in heaven. 
You know, we will sometimes see the rich man called by the name Dives, but that's not his name. That's just Latin for rich man. Let our name not be Dives. Let our names be written in God's book in heaven. You know, in St. John Chrysostom's day, actors at a theatre often wore masks. And St. John Chrysostom compares this life to a play at a theatre. And when the play is over, the actors take off their masks and show who they really are. And he says, one day the masks will be removed. And then we'll see who is truly rich and who is truly poor. St. John says that the poor man Lazarus is a teacher for all of us. Because if he did not complain when he was poor, what pardon will those have who complain even though they're rich? If Lazarus gave thanks in hunger and in so many troubles... What excuse will those have who do not give thanks even when they enjoy abundance? St. John also says, when you see on earth someone who has encountered the shipwreck of poverty, do not judge him. Do not seek an account of his life, but free him from his misfortune. God has excused us from all officiousness and meddlesomeness. He asks us to give alms, not to judge. He says, Christ lies at your door, the pearl in the mud, and you do not see him? Christ the physician is at your gate, and you do not accept his treatment? You feed animals, and yet you do not feed the poor. Nothing can make a person an imitator of Christ like caring for his neighbours, caring for the poor. And he says, if you don't remember anything else, remember this, I beg you without fail, that not to share our own wealth with the poor is theft from the poor and deprivation of their means of life. Let us remember to be kind. Let us remember not to be meanies like the rich men we've heard about today. But what if you have been an old mean? What if you have ignored the poor and those in need what's going to happen to you is it just the monster you have to look forward to is there no hope well listen to St Paul in the epistle where he says God was pleased to reveal his son to me God called me from my mother's womb before I was born And was pleased to reveal his son to me. Even if you're a meanie. Listening to this. Even if you're a nasty old meanie. God is still calling to you. God has called you from before you were born. From your mother's womb. And he is pleased to reveal his goodness to you in Jesus Christ. He is pleased To reveal Jesus Christ to you. In a way that you can change. In a way that you can stop being an old meaning. And become a good person. Anybody remember Charles Dickens' Christmas Carol? With Ebenezer Scrooge. Now there's an old meaning if ever there was one. He was the meanest man alive. And yet as he gets a glimpse into the next world. He changes. He becomes good. He buys the biggest Christmas turkey in the butchers and sends it to his employee. He becomes good and kind and celebrates Christmas. If you're baptised, then you know that Christ has called you 
Christ has chosen you and Christ is pleased to reveal himself to you. Let him reveal himself to you in a way that changes whatever kind of meaning you are. And it changes whatever kind of meaning you may once have been. So that you too can be rich in the kingdom of heaven where Lazarus is no longer poor. Glory to Jesus Christ.